with us. I uh, want to let you know we're, we're finishing up our study of the big picture, and we are uh, finishing up that. This is our 15th lesson tonight, and essentially tonight is the book of Revelation. And so what I'm going to do tonight is give us an overview of the book of Revelation. Uh, we are out of books. We gave out the last one about a week or so ago, um, so I know we don't have any of them left. But um, if you... If you did not get one of the handouts on the podium in the back, there's a couple young men walking through the auditorium. Uh, just raise your hand and they'll bring those to you. What, we, what we'll do is we'll go through the, uh, the lesson. Um, I know we've got several that don't have books tonight, and because of the book of Revelation, I'm going to do it just a little differently. I'm going to use it from the text itself as far as uh, a lot of the... Uh, the breakup goes, but we'll also use the book also, and then we'll do the questions at the end. So we're, we're treating this as a Bible class, and like I said, uh, we're finishing it up tonight. We did it on Wednesday nights, but we had two left over, and we started our summer series, so we weren't able to do the last two lessons. One thing to notice, you've got an outline, or a, a page, and... Um, a couple things about it for those that that are visiting with us and aren't used to being with us. Um, on the back we have a word search and all the words are at the bottom. And if you look at that word search and you don't remember the name Betty being in the book of Revelation, that's correct. Betty is not in Revelation. But one of the things I've done is if you fill out a word search and give it to me, uh, the, and by uh, a few days in advance, I put the names of everybody that, that does one of the word searches into a drawing and I pull a name out and the person that I pull their name out, they end up being in the puzzle for the next week. And so Betty Wright is the one for our puzzle tonight. The other 29 words all have to do with the book of Revelation, but, but that one doesn't. So if you look at that and think, I don't remember there being a Betty, well there wasn't. But, but she's the one that, that's in the puzzle. On the flip side of that, I generally have a map or, a, or something else that has to do with our study. And I have, this is something I worked up several years ago when I was teaching the book of Revelation as some terms in the book. And I want to go over those real fast. You know, a lot of people think of the book of Revelation and immediately think, oh, can't understand it. Well, in reality, the definition of the word revelation means something revealed. And... And Dane, you might have to turn this way down. It's, it's really up there. I, it's not? Sounds fine? Because I'm hearing a lot of back feed from it. Well, anyway, I'll just keep going. The term revelation means something that's revealed. In other words, something shown, something understood. That's the exact opposite of what a lot of people think of. One thing to know is the people that John wrote to knew what he was talking about. They had an understanding of the things that he was looking at and pointing to. And so it was something to be something that was revealed, made known to them, and not something hidden. The thing is, is sometimes by way of us living in a different day and time and not having the shared experiences that they all had, sometimes we don't always know the exact answer, but they had a pretty clear understanding of what it was. And so that's important to note. It's one of the things also that shows that you know the, the letter was originally written for them, although it can apply to us and we can gain great benefit from it. It was written to seven specific churches in Asia in a specific day and time, just like the other books of the Bible were written. Another term that comes up sometimes is apocalyptic. And Hollywood has done us a terrible disservice by putting the term apocalypse or apocalyptic or whatever in movie titles, but they're not really talking about what it really is. Apocalyptic language in its real definition is symbolic language. And it really has nothing to do with the end of times. The, the study of the end of times is called eschatology, and that's the next word that's there. There are some things in Revelation referring to the end of times, but saying that the, the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic language doesn't mean it's talking about the end of times. 
Uh, there are other places in the Bible that deal with apocalyptic things like uh, Daniel and a lot of the prophets, uh, Zechariah and some others deal with that. And just simply using symbols for different things. Eschatology is the study of, of things about the end of time. Um, there are three, there, there's more theories because there's just, there's just almost as many theories as there are people. But there's primarily two main theories that people have on the book of Revelation. Uh, I have three of them listed. The one, the first one is the one that you hear a lot. Most, I would say most of the denominational world believes this first one. And that is the idea of premillennialism. That we live in a day and time in which there is going to be, at some point, a 1,000 year reign that is going to come in, be brought in by world events, by wars and other things, the result of that is that there's going to be a thousand year reign with Jesus sitting on the throne and that time frame being there. Um, and that's what i um, looking at. Um, this is pretty much, that's the view that the 700 Club that Pat Robertson is on TV and has told people about for the last 30 or 40 years. It's also the focus of the Left Behind book series, if you're familiar with them. That's what they're teaching. And what they're doing is they wrote a fictional story about the things that are coming about. Like I say, there's probably more denominations that teach this than don't. And generally, uh, people that look at the news and they see wars and rumors of wars and other things and hear those kind of things, they, they uh, bring that out and they say, oh, it's a sign, it's the end of times. And it's not really that at all. There's always been wars. There's always been different things going out about human history. It magnifies it when you come up on the things, you know, some of us that are a little older, remember all the panic that was going to happen when the clocks all clicked over the year 2000. There was all this madness. People rushing to ATMs and emptying them out because we're going to, the society was going to crash, all the computers were going to crash. It was barely a blip when, when 2000 happened. The same way with 9-11 that, that people felt the sky was falling, it was going to be, and as terrible as it was, the world didn't come to a stop and there was no uh, world war or anything like that that brought in any kind of thousand year reign. And many today that are so solidly behind Israel, and I think we should be, but many, the reason why they're so solidly behind Israel is they believe we've got to preserve Israel to make it ready for the thousand year reign. And that's not biblical at all. Not anywhere in Scripture. I think we should preserve Israel because they're a good ally. The same as Canada and other places. But not because we've got to protect them for the thousand year reign. Postmillennialism kind of believes that Jesus will come after the thousand years. That there will be a thousand year reign and Jesus will come after it and then come. Less people believe that, but there are some that do. Now, if you had to put a title on the belief of revelation that most of us probably already have is the last one. And it's called amillennialism. You probably don't identify as an amillennialist, uh, but, but that's probably what you really are. Amillennialists basically believe that the book of Revelation was, was focused on the people of that day, the events of that day, and that the thousand year reign is not a literal time frame but merely a mention of and a, and, a, and a figure for the Christian age itself. That we live in that thousand year reign of the, the reign of Jesus' kingdom here on earth. And we'll see some things as we look through the book later on as we go through that. But that basically is what we are. A millennial just simply means you're in that millennial. That, that millennial is, is ongoing. Um, not a literal thousand years because we're already 2,000 years in or thereabout into the church. And so, basically that. There's some other notable passages that if we had more time, if we were doing the whole lesson on this, we would look at um, Matthew chapter 25. You notice I don't include Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is actually the destruction of Jerusalem. That passage is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Chapter 25 is talking about the destruction of the world. And he gives three uh, parables there about readiness. The the parable of the sheep and goats, the the uh, ten virgins, and um, the master coming back from the from the uh, trip. 
And so those are all about being watchful, being ready. Then also 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18 talks about the man of lawlessness that God is over, going to overcome by the breath of His mouth. And you see in 2 Peter 3, 1-13 how that the earth is going to be destroyed, laid bare, destroyed by fire. And so that, that is listed there. So anyway, um, that real quick on the outline. Now to the book of Revelation itself. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Revelation, to Revelation 1. I want to read the first three verses. You find a lot in just these first three verses. Revelation 1, 1 through 3 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show to His servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending His angel to His servant John who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that He saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Something you notice when you look at this, who is behind this book? Well, who's behind this book? Uh, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to Him. So, the line of authority comes from God and Jesus Christ Himself. And it comes to an angel who then in turn brings that to John. Much the way much of the Scripture comes about. And so John receives this and John brings about the testimony of it. And he pronounces a blessing upon all of those that read it, all those that hear it, and all those that keep it. And so, those that, those that read, those that hear, and those that keep. So, what you might notice is, is that there's a different uh, level. There's those that read it and those that hear it. And, you know, they could very well be referring to, to some people that, that at the day and time weren't able to read. That were illiterate. And so, they would be the ones that received the reading of it but yet they were all going to be held accountable to it and, and, and blessed by it if they followed it. And that final blessing is for those that, that kept it or heard it and, and followed after it. He emphasizes that the time is near. The book of Revelation begins with the statement, the time is near. And then he goes on to uh, greet the seven churches. He sends a greeting to them. And he gives to them some things. Chapter 1 is an amazing chapter. If you look at chapter 1, it's the beginning of the vision that he has. And he sees, um, he, he sees a vision of the Son of Man. We recognize it's Jesus that, that he sees. And he hears the voice. And he hears that he's, the voice says to him in verse 8, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And then he says, Who is and who it was and who is to come, the Almighty. One of the things Jesus calls Himself in the Gospel of John is, I am the I Am. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying right here. I'm the one who is, who was, and will be. He's the, the, the constant state of being. He talks about seeing, uh, seeing the, the vision that is there and in verses 9 and following. He sees a vision and He tells that this book is going to be written to the seven churches. He lists those churches in, verses, in verse 11. He then says that, that he's the one that he mentions the, the golden lampstands in verse 12. And he, he talks about the things that, that are going to be associated with that. And, and then also he says in uh, verse 16, in his right hand are the seven stars. In his mouth came the two-edged sword, and from his face was shining like the sun in full strength. We don't have a lot of time to look at all this, but you recognize that this is a glorification of Jesus like you find it on the Mount of Transfiguration, which John had been a witness to earlier on in his life. And you also recognize that the words that Jesus is speaking are like a two-edged sword. And we recognize that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Also, he talks about having the, the stars in his right hand. When you look at the individual letters in chapters 2 and 3, you will notice when you see uh, 
like in chapter 2, in talking to Ephesus, um, what you'll see in the book of Revelation, that the term stars throughout the book is in relation to the angels. And he gives in chapter 1 a little bit of the answer key of the book. And so the times throughout the book when you see the term star, he's talking about angels. He's talking about what they are doing and how they're, how they're working. And so you see that in that first, um, first chapter. In verse 20, look here and see what it says. He says, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw at my right hand, and the seven gold lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so he's giving you a little bit of the answer key for the book. When he's talking about stars, he's talking about churches. I mean, excuse me, the angels. And when he talks about the lampstands, he's talking about the individual churches that are the seven churches of Asia. You come over to chapter 2. Chapters 2 and 3 are the individual letters to the seven churches. In our outline book, if you've got one of those, on page 212, he has a listing of those and has a listing of the chapters and verses that they're associated with. He also, in chapter page, on page 213, has a map of where those all are. And then he does, and this is one of the things I like about the book here, is he shows the repeated phrase there on page 213. And he lists all seven of the churches and where they're repeated. To each one of them, he says, to the angel of the church... That's who he addresses it to. And the word angel means a messenger in, in the Scriptures. The word messenger and angel are the same word except for context is how you know which is which. And he told each of them he knew their works. He told each of them to the one, he says to the one who conquers. And he also to all of them says to the one who hears. All of those are connected together. And he says that to all of them. He also in each one of those, he identifies himself as a different thing in each one of those seven. And there's a great lesson there with all of those. Like say in, in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus, of course, is speaking, and He identifies Himself as the one who holds the seven stars in His right hand. When you come down in verse 8 to the, to the letter at Smyrna, here's how He identifies Himself. He says, "...the words of the first and the last." who died and came to life. Then you go over to verse 12. He says, The words of Him who has the sharp two-edged sword. You go down to, to verse 18, to the, to the church at Thyatira, and He says, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire, and His feet are like burnished bronze. He's drawing back on chapter 1. And He's drawing back on pointing out who He is. And it's Jesus speaking in each of these. And He's identifying Himself as another part of His deity and another part of His power and identifying with that vision that John had seen. In chapter 3, verse 1, He says, The words of Him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. In, in verse 7, He says, The words of the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key to David, who opens the one will not shut, who shuts the one will not open. And then in verse 14 to the church at Laodicea, he says the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And so each and every one of those, Jesus identifies Himself in a different way, all associated with that in chapter 1. And so chapters 2 and 3 are the individual letters. And boy, they're a great, they're a, they're a gold mine of stuff. They're all together. Um, each of those individual letters and and, and certainly that would be something to look at at a different time. But those letters are, are there and, and they're, they're powerful. And, and all but one of the churches has something negative said about them. And the church at, at Philadelphia has nothing negative said about it. And, and you know, good, the good things there, the rest of them all had some negative things they needed to learn from and grow from. You think of Ephesus. Ephesus is the recipient of the book of Ephesians from Paul and now later on this book. And they're not what they used to be. They've fallen from a great height and they've left their first love. And that's, that's a pretty sad commentary on what the church Ephesus had become from the time that, that uh, Paul had been with them. The next big thing I want us to get is chapter 4. If you can get the first four chapters, I think you can really understand the book of Revelation well. 
And chapter 4 begins what really comes through the rest of the book. If you can picture one thing in your mind, in your, mind's, in, in your mind, um, you know, obviously we don't know what this looks like, but the one thing that you'll notice in Revelation 4, and you see it through the rest of the book, and it's going to be uh, brought about in, in uh, page 214 in our, in our lesson book, and that is the throne of God. If you look at the rest of Revelation, everything shoots out of, comes off of the throne of God. That is the place that everything is oriented from. It's the, it's the marker everything else is based off of. What you have is the throne, and you have the one who sits on the throne. He isn't often called God. We know that's God. But we, we, he's often called the one who sits on the throne. But it's certainly talking about God Himself. That God is on the throne. And that the Lamb that was slain, who's also called the Lion of Judah, we know as Jesus Christ, is on His right side next to the throne of God. And then there are the four creatures that are around the, the uh, throne of God. The one that has the face like the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And then outside of them, there are the 24 elders. And outside of them, there are the angels. And outside of them, as the book progresses, are the host, the 144,000. And outside of them, there are the host of all nations that are, are out there. And all of those individuals are all centered around, focused upon what is front and center, and that is the throne of God. And everything, at, at virtually every place you will find, it begins with the throne of God, or what is immediately to the right hand of the throne of God is Jesus Himself. And so all of heaven is focused on it. The throne of God is an, is an awesome and awe-inspiring thing. In verse 5, He talks about seeing flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and burning torches of fire all emanating out of throne of God. That's one powerful chair that, that God is sitting upon. And then we have all of that that is from throughout that. Now we come upon what is the major section as far as the amount of chapters. You have the scroll and the lamb. The scroll that is out there that, that, is, uh, that is going to be opened. And you look at the seals that come about, you look at the bowls of wrath, and here's what it comes down to. And like I said, time's not going to allow us to look at all of this. But what we need to notice is, is that in the beginning of Revelation and in the end of Revelation, he points out that these things are going to take place soon. And he writes it to seven specific churches. And then he points out that everything emanates from the throne of God. And when everything is going to go back, for the early church in the first, set, latter first, second, third century, up until the the three hundreds, when the Roman Church all of a sudden, when when um, Constantine becomes a Christian and, and persecution of Christians is outlawed, now that's probably actually in the long term a negative thing on the church, but the persecution stops. But at any rate, the the time frame before that that's being talked about, it's going to be really rough on them. There are going to be many Christians die. It is during that time frame that we find out that a lot of the Roman uh, Caesars put Christians in the arena and they were killed by gladiators. They were killed by lions and tigers and all kinds of things. And they were persecuted uh, uh, mercilessly. And there was great persecution upon the church and the salient point for them to all realize, and it's even true for us to realize today, and that is the throne of God is intact and aware of anything and everything that takes place here on earth. And one of the things you find out later in the book is that the blood of the saints cry out before God. And God hears them. God doesn't necessarily answer on that day, but God hears them. And God duly notes that. And God will take care of His saints and He'll punish any that are against His people. 
one of the great things about the, um, the, the section is one of the pinnacle moments is when the scroll is presented and no one in heaven is found worthy to open up the scroll. But the, one of the angels says to John not to weep because John began to weep. And he says, don't weep, don't worry. The Lamb of God can open it. And of course, when you stop to think about that, who, who could write a book that could be sealed so that nobody could open it? Who was who powerful enough to write a book, to author a book, and then powerful enough to put a seal that nobody, and I mean nobody, could open? Well, only God and Jesus would be able to have such power. Why can Jesus open the scroll? Because it's His book. He has the right power and authority because He was the us that made man in our image, like God said in Genesis 1. And Jesus was the eternal God. He was the Word with God, as John 1.1 1, 1 says. He was there with God in the beginning. He created all things. He's preeminent in all things. He is the, invisible, the image of the invisible God, as Colossians 1 calls Him. And so, with that, why can Jesus open the scroll when nobody else can? Because it's His and God's book. They're the only ones with the power and authority to put a seal on a book that nobody else can open. And so He opens it. And He, and he gives that out. And the result of that is the seven seals that, that come off of that. And then from that, there are the, um, the seven bowls of God's wrath. And so what are all these sevens about? Well, seven in, 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 uh, in the Bible and seven in, in, in it is the sign of a completeness. A sign of a wholeness. In other words, God is not going to leave anything undone. God is going to do it fully. And God is going to leave it all uh, taken care of. So every little bit of persecution and difficulty that anybody in the church is going to experience, any wrong brought upon them in the name of the Lord, God's going to deal with it. And He's going to deal with all that have perpetrated any of those things. And the, the seven bowls of God's wrath are going to be complete, just the same. So He is going to completely help. He's going to completely save. And that message is going to be proclaimed out to all of humans, all of human history, by way of the seven trumpets. And all of that's going to come about. So everybody's going to know about the... The, the things that are coming out. If you'll look at, on pages 218 and 219, and talking about the seven trumpets, and talking about the seven bowls of God's wrath, and you'll notice that all the things that are around are going to be taken care of. The vegetation, the seas, the river, the sun, anything on this earth, anything in the sky, anything around us, are going to be uh, taken care of by God's message, and punished by God's wrath, if they're on the wrong side of it. One of the things to notice in verses in chapter 17 through 20 is that Satan is going to do all he can to fight against God and God's people, and he's going to lose. He's going to lose, and he's going to lose every time, and he's definitely going to lose before the battle even starts. He is lost in this Christian age, he is lost in it, and he is going to be destroyed passage I want you to, uh, to notice. And uh, he, he lists it under his conclusion. In Revelation 17, verse 14, he says, They, meaning Satan and his allies, will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called and chosen are faithful. And so Jesus is going to defeat all of them. He's going to defeat them with... Uh, the great battle. He's going to defeat them in, in all ways. Verse I like even better than that one to show what's going to happen in this time of, of the book of Revelation is in chapter 12. Turn with me to chapter 12 and verse 11. What you find here is, is the great battle is building up. The great battle of Satan coming down to earth. Satan coming to fight against God's people. They, uh, he's bringing all that he's got to fight against God and His people. And what you notice is, is that heaven is coming out to, to uh, fight against Him. And look at verse 11. 
And he says, And they have conquered him, meaning Satan, with what? By the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives unto death. If you're saved, how are you saved? Through the blood of the Lamb, aren't you? You're saved by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb has washed each and every one of us as our sins. At what time in human history is the blood of the Lamb the power to defeat Satan? I swear I didn't touch anything. But anyway, it went out. Maybe my aura knocked it out. We looked um, a few months ago at, the, at probably one of the most famous texts in Revelation, and that is in Revelation 21 of the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Okay? And when you look at this, you look at John is, is coming to the end of the, the vision. And an angel shows him, says to him, I'm, there's a new heaven, a new earth. He tells him about that in the beginning of the chapter. And he goes over into verse 9 because he tells him he's going to take him up there. And, and look at this. And then came one of the seven angels who had poured out the bowls for the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. All through the New Testament, what is the bride of Christ? What is the bride of the Lamb? It's the church. All through the New Testament. We saw it this morning in our Bible class in 2 Corinthians 11 that Paul said, I prepared you as a bride, a, a virgin bride prepared for your, your groom, which is Christ. All throughout the New Testament, the bride of the Lamb, the wife of the Lamb, is the church. Okay? He says, I'm going to show it to you. The bride of the Lamb, the wife of the Lamb. And he said, and he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And then he goes on to describe the city show you the bride of Christ or show you the wife of the Lamb. And then he immediately shows him the new Jerusalem in all its beauty and wonder and splendor. The beauty of the, of the new Jerusalem is the church itself. Now, does heaven look like this? We don't know. John's writing it from a human perspective. But the new Jerusalem in the text, in the context, is the bride of Christ that has come down. And it is the new, the new Jerusalem is the church. 
a more beautiful land than the bride of Christ? Really nothing. And the beauty, the wonder, the splendor, all of those things are describing how that, that is the case. And the, the, the beautiful city of God is God's people. Much like this morning we saw in second in First Peter chapter two, that we are a spiritual building made up of living stones formed and fashioned by, by God Himself. And so that we are the holy city of God, we are his family, and we are the bride of Christ Himself. You go to the last chapter and you also recognize here we are in chapter 22. And how does he end the book? Verse 20. He says, He who testifies these things says, and here it is, Jesus quoted again, Surely I am coming soon. And that's how the book ends, other than just the, the greeting that John gives him out. He also says in verse 12, and the verse before that, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Uh, alpha and Omega, Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last. If you don't, if you don't understand what that is. And so, the beginning and the end of all of it is there. We say A to Z. We say Alpha and Omega. Okay. I just went through the book of Revelation in 35 minutes. Uh, I hesitate to do this. Does any of you have any questions? <laughs> okay, good. No. Uh, I will entertain anybody's questions. Um, as I started out this study, and I reiterated it not long ago, if there's anything you want to go back through and look at, uh, we'll do that when we get done with our summer series on Wednesday nights. If there's anything that just jumped out at you or I said something like, and you said, well, I never thought of that, let's go back to that, let me know, and we'll do that when our summer series is over on our Wednesday evenings. If you want to study more about the throne of God, or if you want to study about the the sevens in Revelation or whatever. Uh, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, so I, I, in recent years, taught the book of Revelation through a chapter a week, all the way through. And so, uh, anyway. Never done it in 40 minutes, though. So we did it tonight. All right, we're going to skip the first section on page 221. The answers are on the bottom of the page. Time's not going to let us do all that. Um, the fill in the blanks, let everybody do them tonight because we got to move them on. Why was Jesus the only one who could open the scroll and seven seals? Yes? Okay, he was redeemed and it was his blood on the cross. It's his book, yes. The four cycles of seven presented in the book of Revelation identify each of them. What are the four? The seven cycles. What's that? Seven seals, the trumpets, bowls of wrath, and there's seven churches, okay? The passages, uh, they're, they're listed on the previous page. We'll let you look at those, put those up. Uh, the, in Zechariah 6, 1 through 8, there are four horsemen mentioned, uh, chariots that are sent out. The colors are different. Does anybody have an idea why they're different? Well, the big thing is. I would say is they're describing a different time and reason. The, chari the chariots and the horses going out in the world is the fact that God's message is going to go throughout the world. And Zechariah, if I understand it correctly, is talking about the church and how it's going to spread out into the world. And in, uh, in Revelation, it's talking about the message of God's deliverance and God's wrath based on where you line up. Um, what does it mean, number four, that the prostitute was drunk with the blood of the saints? That's called for language for saying a whole bunch of people were killed because of the God of Christ. Each of the four living creatures' faces resemble either um, it is sea, a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. Number two, the letters were addressed to the, the angel of each church. According to Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the book of Revelation is primarily about the events that A took place soon after the book was written. The seventh seal is is what? C, yes, the seven trumpets. Where on the body 
place where the 144,000 sealed? Forehead. Forehead. Yeah. The members of the church at Smyrna are told that they would receive what? If they remain faithful. See a crown of life. Uh, discussion questions real fast. Do you think it was important to see God on his throne in chapter 4 before the destructive forces were unleashed on the earth? Why or why not? And the thing I'd say is absolutely. Um, absolutely, because it is important to know that with all, everything breaking loose, no God is on his throne. As much of a mess as our world is in right now, where's God? On his throne. Where's the Lamb of God? Right there in his right. And all the other things are, are where they are. What's the significance of John being told to turn around and see the line of Judah when he instead saw was the Lamb? Jesus is called both the Lion of Judah, the Lion being the King, and the Lamb being the sacrificial Lamb given for the sins of the world. Jesus was both in a, in a very almost... Uh, amazing way Jesus was the lion and he's the lamb. The, explain the significance of the church having his lampstand removed means that they're, they're not going to be under God's blessing anymore. They're not going to be taken care of by God. And he's going to punish them because of that. Twice in Revelation it says Satan is the red dragon is called the beast of the serpent. Why do you think he's called that? Because when you look at the book of Genesis chapter 3 there was the serpent that comes up to Adam and Eve and tries to get into sin and does, he's successful, and he's called a serpent. I think that's our introduction to Satan. Number five, do you think God is merely cruel when he unleashes such terrible plagues and disasters on his enemies? Um, he mentions Revelation 9.20. Um, God's given fair warning to any and all about his judgment, about his wrath that's going to come. And certainly if we don't eat that, if we don't uh, obey that warning, and we'll be on the wrong side of it too, just like that. You know, if you, if you just if you don't get anything else from Revelation, realize this: two things. If you get these two things, nothing else. I think you got one is God's people are going to win. They're going to win. And number two, everybody else is touched. That's my vernacular. But everybody else is just gone. They're quite literally touched, okay? So, know that. God's people are going to win, and everybody else is in big, big trouble. And you can get that. So, if you are troubled like I am by watching the news, and today was not a good news day, and terrible, terrible things have gone on, and, and how, how do you look at that? You know, that's not, that's not the way God wants things to be, and what have you. But, you know, there's a lot of evil in our world, Country's in a mess, and, and we're better off than most of the people on the planet. You know, but know this God is still on that throne, and nothing's changed. And that throne is not going to fall out of the sky, it's going to stay flat. Okay, we are at the end of our time, and so, like we always do when we come together, we always offer an invitation. And so, I want to say to you is this um, God's people are going to win, and they're going to be the people in heaven. The rest are going to end up in a, in a lake of fire. And I'll tell you this. To experience the beauties and wonders and amazement and awesomeness of heaven is going to make all it worthwhile. Avoiding hell is also going to make it worthwhile. Heaven is too great to miss and hell is too bad to experience. So which do you want? The carrot or the stick? Whichever motivates you, let it motivate you and realize God's people are going to win. And we need to be ready for that. As you know, the people that are here all the time have heard me say many times. And I would say, how long are you going to have to stare at that throne of God before you realize it was a good idea to get here? They're not going to have to sing many verses and many songs before you realize it was a great idea. So if you're not one tonight, we want to give you that opportunity to come give your life to Christ. Come believe that Jesus died for you and defend your sins. Confess him as your Lord and be baptized tonight. Have all your
your sins washed away. You can be washed in the blood of the Lamb, and you can experience the victory of Revelation, as we saw it in Revelation 12, verse 11. The blood of the Lamb can cleanse you like it's cleansed all of us, the rest of us, in the same power that destroyed Satan and Satan, that destroyed him in that great battle. And if you are a Christian, and you've lost sight of that, you've left him, you've wandered from him, and you want us to help you and help you find your way back, find your we want to help you with that as well. We can help in any way. Would you sing the song, the number one song here, 382? 